Hi, Joel. Good evening. Hey, hey, buddy. How are you? I am well. Which time zone are you in? Uh, right now, I'm in EST. <laughs> All right. Very good. So, evening your time. Yeah, it's evening. It's, it's early morning for you, correct? Uh, indeed, it is. Nice. Do you do a like morning routine? You run? How do you get prepared for the day? Depends on where I am. If I'm in Beijing, then I just get to the office early before all the traffic starts. And we'll call that uh, the routine that I'm quite happy to start <laughs> with. Uh, when I'm uh, in other places, it's a little different. I tend to do my exercise later. How about you? Yeah, I do a, like a 5.30 or 6 a.m. run. And then I make some breakfast and get to the office around 7.30 yep. and Yep. Then I'll take a, a break around two o'clock and go to the gym three, three times a week, not every day. And then I come back family time. And then I'm here till about eight, eight thirty. All right. Good, so good. spending my thirties, uh, all the energy, whenever I listen to the individuals who are in their sixties, they're saying, spend your energy while you can. And so I take that advice to heart. <laughs> I, I was actually reading a, a book around uh, sleep, interestingly, right? And I, I think uh, the aspiration that we should all have energy throughout our entire lives and hopefully not just when you're in your 30s, because that's pretty depressing. Yeah, I've been using, I've been using uh, this app called Sleep Cycle. Yeah. And it, it listens to how you breathe when you sleep and then it monitors your exercise. So it'll, the idea is that it'll create connections between what you do throughout the day, what you eat, and then how you sleep. Yeah. It's amazing. Is it on like a tracker or a wrist or is it on your phone? No. So it's on your phone and you put it on your nightstand and it yeah. has to be plugged in and then it just listens to your breathing. Cool. But it works. Like it, uh, I, I started watching the graph and adjusting my data. And then I found out if I added the run to my mornings, then I sleep better. That's just for my, you know, myself. And so I really, uh, I found a lot of benefit in it. That's some pretty hardcore. I mean, I know a lot of friends also, that's a lot of hardcore digitizing your life. I haven't let data get into my sleep. I'm a little bit more old school in that respect of, do I feel rested when I wake up is my measure. Yeah. So what it does, and this is why I like it. And I don't digitize my whole life. Uh, I try to disconnect from technology as much as possible. I'm big in nature. Yep. And what this does is it will, you set a window that you want to wake up. So I say, all right, here's a 30 minute window. And it, based on my sleeping pattern, it'll wake me up at the most opportune time for me to feel rested. Ah, okay. So that, that seems yeah. a little bit less intrusive. Okay. I was glad to hear you say that because I, I also find it slightly ironic that people want to digitize their sleep and they're telling me they're looking at their smartphone at night and trying to optimize. And I'm like, well, you know, the, Radio, the light from the smartphone actually keeps you awake longer. <laughs> yeah, so I do the whole hour before, no electronics, and because it's that blue light, you know, we're humans, the sky is like bright and blue in the morning, that's gonna wake us up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So cool. this is the podcast, by the way. Oh, this just isn't, It's not just small talk, hello. So <laughs> uh, I just wanted you to know that. And uh, I'm really excited to be talking to you. I love your history. Uh, I heard great things from Jackie. She said she had been speaking to you and um, that you were very, very bright. And I can obviously see this here also by, by your notes and what you've been able to accomplish. McKinsey and company, come on, how did that happen? McKinsey actually was very much of an accident. And so I, I was a software developer. I have a computer science background. And it was really... Uh, I think you're going to laugh, but I think it was literally free food, right? So yeah. as a poor college student, you jump at any opportunity to have something nicer than you would normally have, like cold pizza, leftovers, what have you. And so I think it was literally one of my friends had said, oh, McKinsey is having a dinner tonight. Uh, why don't you come? And I hadn't been invited, but I sort of tagged along and hung out, of, <laughs> out of it. And it just took a life of its own uh, from there. Uh, strangely enough, strangely now in retrospect, but not so strangely at the time, I had no idea who McKinsey was or why I would, would have wanted to talk to them beforehand. So one of the serendipities of life. Yes. Sometimes, you know, I'm always open to new opportunity and I work hard 
And when I found out that it was literally that simple, like you work very hard, you continuously learn, you stay open to new opportunity, you take care of yourself, you follow through, you do these basic things and that we all know we should do. And then life really changes if you, if you really focus on them. Yes, I know. I think that's, uh, that's also proven to be true in my experience as well. And then the only thing I would add on top of that is, uh, is a dash of luck. Right? If you're, open, oh. and you're smart, you work hard, I think you're more likely to, but I think uh, luck and serendipity, as I mentioned, play an underappreciated role. 100%. I, I fully agree. Looking back on my timeline, those pivotal moments that really changed the course were just one and in, one in infinite. It was just, you know, so, oh, I just get excited thinking about it. Yeah, it's like a movie. It's like those key points in the movie, the highlight, right? Yeah, exactly. Or so where the plot really... It has a fork in the road and you have to choose. Yeah. Are you in China right now? Yes, exactly. So it's uh, 7 a.m. here, bright and early. My sister just moved back. She spent five years there in Shenzhen. Okay. Yeah, she yeah, just moved back. Fabulous. I'm sure. I, I'm not sure what she was doing there or the energy, but uh, I, I think it's a place that's just brimming with new ideas and the, and the collision in a positive way of many new ways of thinking uh, with existing. And so I know the city itself is full of energy. And it's oh yeah. Always, it's different every time you go back, especially if you, you know, it's more than a year or two between when you visit, right? the change is very palpable. Yeah, and she would, uh, that's how I learned about WeChat several years ago, was through you know being able to communicate with her and she would send me all her hiking pictures and how beautiful everything was and the right. nature out there, it was amazing. Excellent. Do you still use WeChat now that she's moved back? Yes, because now I have friends all over the world. Awesome. From the show. So yeah, I pretty much anyone, no one in America really uses it. Like none of my American friends uh, mention it at all. They just are all basically on text message and group yep. chats. Yep. And then every other person in the world is WeChat. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You'll have to add me or I'll have to add you after the, uh, after this uh, chat or we'll hook up afterwards. But it's, uh, oh, absolutely. So yeah. tell me a little bit about how you got involved uh, with Lenovo. Yeah. So Lenovo actually comes out of the earlier, uh, just what we talked about and when I joined McKinsey. So I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to work in multiple places around the world in Silicon Valley and Europe and China. Uh, and at some point early in my career, I decided also to come to China to work. And so I spent mm -hmm. time in Hong Kong right across the uh, harbor and right across the way from Shenzhen. And so as luck would have it, once again, uh, as, uh, as I got towards what was then the end of my tenure uh, with McKinsey, though I didn't know it at the time, Lenovo was actually one of my clients that I was serving. And through a combination of circumstances, uh, the time was right when the company was looking to make some pretty major changes in how it thought about business transformation and how it thought about uh, using technology to move forward. And so I jumped at the opportunity to make the, the shift, which I think is classic uh, for many of moving from, uh, you know, giving advice and uh, to, uh, to a company to trying your hand at uh, owning something on behalf of a company and driving progress from another perspective. But your background, I totally prepared you for this. Yes and no, right? I think, again, it's one of those things in hindsight where you say, oh, right, <laughs> all, all those things fit into pieces and I can use all the skills that I built up. Uh, but at the time, it certainly felt jumping in to something entirely new. I, I think uh, for me, uh, Lenovo's culture is very global, right? Its leadership team is very global and that certainly helps my, my acclimation. What I probably wasn't as prepared for, right? Because I think when you have a good technical and a good engineering background and you also that my time at McKinsey had helped round me out in terms of business what I was really unprepared for when I joined Lenovo was that shift right that shift in mindset of moving from an advisor to someone who is actually the buck stops with you there's nobody else right? when you look around there's nobody else that's going to be uh, accountable of something doesn't get done right, on the downside, or if something does get done, then hey, it was me. And so <laughs> that was, I can sound simple in concept, but I think uh, grasping that took me 
actually quite some time. Now, when you got to the opportunity to move to China and, and work there with Lenovo, like you said, they're a global company, right? And did you have to learn the language or did you already know it? Right. So that's a slightly separate uh, story by itself. So I okay. effectively had to learn it. I actually came to China with, uh, with McKinsey at the time and I had transferred with them to Hong Kong. And I grew up in the U.S. And so I did not, uh, while well, I, I could hear and listen to and understand a little bit of the language, uh, I guess it was a different time than today. Right? Today, it seems very strange because I see, I live in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area currently. And more often than not, all, many of our friends and many of their families are sending their kids to learn Chinese on the weekend mm -hmm. uh, or even Mandarin immersion school. But that totally how it, it wasn't how it was when I grew up, where I think I felt a lot of pressure to just learn English. And why did I need Chinese? And China was this other country that uh, wasn't really on the radar. So I didn't have much of a foundation. And but when I came over to China to work, it pretty quickly became apparent to me that uh, being of uh, Chinese descent, so I'm Chinese American, uh, mm -hmm. Being of Chinese descent, but not speaking the language in China is not a recipe for success. Right. That's at difficult. All. At all. Yeah. So I had to essentially go on a crash course and figure out very quickly how to pick it up. And so I think in this case, a combination of urgent need plus the right environment really helps light a fire under you. Is there a big working difference? So I work with all sorts of companies, you know, enterprise, small business, and here in the United States, and then some in Sweden, and some in Brazil. But is there, I noticed that there's some, there's some culture differences, but there are some really strong trends that you can, that everyone wants to, you know, be productive and make things happen and push, push the world forward and do better for the next generation. Do you find that everyone can, you know, collect around those commonalities? Yeah, I think actually I would agree with that statement pretty strongly, right? Having been on multiple, having viewed this issue from multiple sides, I think the so-called cultural aspect of differences gets overplayed some, right? Not that there aren't differences. There are very real differences, of course, in culture and how people behave. But I found variation to be more on a company by company on their culture. Right? Yes. So found, and, and so I don't, I think people sometimes use it as an excuse, like, oh, the culture in X country or the culture in X it's, is different. And that's why. And again, it has a contributing factor, but it's never quite been that simple in my experience because it's, I, I guess it's just the problem of reductionism. Even in China, right, with so many companies, you're by definition going to have a constellation of cultures and different styles and ways of working. And so culture is one contributor, but I found more meaningful differences, uh, both having been at Lenovo for quite some time in a variety of roles, but also having seen many dozens of companies in my tenure with McKinsey, that how a company works and its culture is actually pretty specific and plays uh, as strong, if not a stronger role in how to get things done. So that's why I think some of the universals around right, trying to drive change, to make a better future, to use technology in more interesting ways, are our starting points from which in commonality, in commonality uh, that which you can build from. I love it. And you're very well spoken. Like I talked to people, I've done 145 interviews in the past eight months. And which is I, quite it, prolific, by the way. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I was doing three a day and then I lost my voice. And so I had to back it up and then we backed it down to uh, once we really gained some traction in the market, we set it up to just you know, one or two days a week. And uh, it's, it's just been absolutely phenomenal what just an incredible amount of hard work will do. I guess it's almost like for me, it's pushing it. It's like, all right, so I work very hard and I get the results and that's incredibly motivating. So then I think that's the right on. virtuous cycle to get into, right? Hopefully it's not <laughs> work really hard and I'm hating every second, but I guess I have more listeners now, right? I think it's, uh, that sounds really positive. And, um, and I've certainly sampled, uh, you have almost, almost, I think you're into triple digits or almost triple digits now in terms of the, uh, uh, the number of interviews and conversations like this that you've had. Right? And I think it's, uh, it's a terrific breadth uh, and oh, yeah. of topics and, and uh, discussion. And that's the reason why I do it. So I started out because I wanted to 
share information. I was doing some due diligence for investment groups and I saw these technologists come in and they said, you know, and I look very young, I'm in my early thirties. Um, so I've been building since you could build right in this, in the internet. So these individuals would come in and they would be repeating the same mistakes. And I was, so I was like, all right, it's my responsibility. I was looking up some science stuff because I'm just nerdy all around. Right. And I learned about these little uh, organisms called mycelium and they take nutrients and broker nutrients between roots and soil and, and they'll actually exchange things in, in, uh, in life, right? And in, in nature. And so I said, okay, their value is literally bringing information and brokering things from one location to another. And I thought I wanted to bring that value and help all of these people who I can't sit down and have eight different one hour conversations and communicate all I know to this individual. So instead I started writing and that turned into a blog and then people started responding saying this is fantastic and then that turned into a book and then the podcast. So for me, the thing that gets me excited is being able to bring the value. Uh, I have this uh, folder in my phone called Positive and I take screenshots when everybody sends me like thank you notes or tags my book on online and it's just like this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I wanted other people to have the information that I have so they can avoid my mistakes and make better mistakes, right? <laughs> no, and I so. think that's, and I totally admire that because I think that's very much around the hacker ethos. One of the things that we're trying to do and I'm trying to do with my team is also to get a, a stronger engineering culture in place. It, it, uh, for historical reasons, we're not where, we, where I would like us to be on that dimension of how we do. But this I think uh, what you described is really uh, a macro scale of building up a culture of sharing, right? Because I think traditionally as part of the hacker ethos, of sharing what you've known uh, so that people can actually, and it's very much the spirit behind open source as well, right? That's kind of right. doing it, you know, at the, at the code scale. This is much more an integrative at right, lessons learned and patterns of how to apply technology scale. And so I think that's, that's really cool. Yeah, and I, you, you brought up a great point, right? That's the world I grew up in. I, I grew up in, I could go download some code and then improve it and then share my contributions with others and continually snowball this into something we're all working on together. And that's one of the beautiful things about modern technology. It's, it's really leveling the playing field to you have a brain and you can train it and you can take it as far as you want. And now we have this, this medium in which we can engage, interact, do business, and it's all up to uh, how much desire we have. <laughs> right. And I think the fluency and part of why this is important is because I think people's fluency with these concepts, right? You can go from open source at the code level to having test level, to having architecture level, to having then adoption level patterns. Uh, that you apply. And I think the larger the number of people in the community who understand and engage in that, I think obviously the, the greater the value. Right? So as more and more people become fluent uh, in these concepts, that sort of becomes that cycle that you started to describe just a few moments yeah. ago. Yeah. It's like a giant computer system. The more processors we have involved, the, the better chance of survival, the more creativity, just the better all around and uh, more resilient we'll be. Exactly. Okay, I'm, I'm curious to know about your style of leadership. You're obviously leading a large technology company or a division of a technology, it's all technology. It's technology leadership, right? <laughs> so I'm curious to know about what you look for in other leaders that are around you and work on your team and what stands out to you about great leaders. On this one, I'll... A while ago, I'd read the book, uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which I, yep. I think many people are familiar with. And one of the things that really struck me from the book was this notion of, kind of peacetime and, and wartime generals. Uh, and so, again, it's, I, I think it's never, I think there's, of course, some commonality. Right? I think you should be inspirational. You should uh, lead by example. Uh, at the end of the day, and I'll come back to the, the wartime versus peacetime general in, in a in a second. But I, I think fundamentally, leadership is about getting things done, right? which is an outcome orientation. And so in that sense, I'm very open to whatever style that you want to bring uh, to the game and to, to work. As long as you are 
achieving the results. Now, obviously, I think um, there's going to be some, we'll call them boundaries, right? Guardrails, you know, ethically, morally, and that I think we, we assume. Um, but within those very broad parameters, then, uh, style-wise, I think I'm also of the mindset that diversity uh, is important. Right? You don't want a set of clones. You don't want a, right? you don't want people who are too susceptible to groupthink. And so I don't really have too much um, uh, in terms of preference, right? I, I think uh, what I look for is uh, fundamentals, right? So, if, for example, if I'm bringing you on to lead an, a large engineering organization, but you know, you can't tell me the difference syntactically between Python and C sharp or C plus plus, you're probably not the right person, right? But style, in leadership style wise, what's most important and is your ability to engage the team in a way that delivers results. And what's interesting is I actually find myself, I have to force myself to overcome my inherent personal preferences, right? Because I think personally, I'd be comfortable if everyone kind of thought, my, thought like me, taught, talked like me, uh, and just had the same thought patterns. And so I actually consciously try to bring people on uh, who I think, how do we say this? I think would be, I right, produce the right kind of cognitive dissonance. Right? You don't want yes. people who are, whose values are opposed to yours, or right, you want to go this way, and actually they want to go the other way. Right? That's not going to be constructive. But I think if, you know, on your values and your outlook and the direction are aligned, right? then I'm very flexible and I try to look at what the outcomes are. That reminds me of my wife. Like we have the same values and we're on the same track, but she just has this I'll amazing that ability. As a Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she has this amazing ability to see what I don't see. Like she just, she, an event happens and she just has a totally different view of it, but it's also logical. I'm like, that makes sense too. I, I get how you saw that, but it was just so, it, I like how you described it. Um, yeah, those are the, and, those and, are oh, right. Things. And then just to, so just so I wasn't randomly bringing up the wartime <laughs> versus peacetime general. And, and I think that reflects it because I think the best leaders can actually decide when to be which one, uh, yes. right? which is, and it's not that you're all, cause there's situations and it can change depending even on the situation that you're, you're dealing with right? one of the things I feel like as a CIO, every day is a roller coaster, not in a bad way, but there's right there's incredible highs, uh, and you can be talking about really what's aspirational and how we should frame a particular issue for the company or how we want to approach a new technology, uh, and the next minute it might be oh the server broke, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Let's yeah. and and those require very different things, right? So if you if you're thinking about strategy and on, on a topic and longer term thinking, it's a very different mindset than we better go, let's go look at the data center really quickly and run over and see what's going on, right? And why, why is our private cloud uh, down, right? And yeah. so I think uh, to be able, and that's I think one of the hallmarks, which is being flexible to be able to switch between, right? If you, when you need to lead to drive change versus when you need to step back and let teams that are more on a steady state operate well versus when you personally need to, um, you know, engage at a very different level, right? Because I think some of, you know, what I don't like is people who think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the leader. I'm here to right, preside. I'm here to <laughs> bring me reviews and I will look at and I'll approve your decisions. And that might be the answer sometimes, but that can't be the default or the, uh, the sole uh, operating model. I, 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 interesting. I was coming off a, a call with my teams. We're in a bit of a, in an urgent situation that needs remediation. And I said, guys, look, I, if I need to come in and like write test scripts and hit the test button with you so we can finish this weekend, that's what we'll do. Right? Yeah. And that's very different than, okay, how do I get up in front of 10,000 people at the company kickoff and talk about how we're doing on digitalization, right? Totally different things, right? Totally yeah. different approach. But I think just some small examples, because I think that's very illustrative of, right, you need to have very different engagement modes at, very, at different times. No, and that just shows the dynamic qualities is because nothing comes naturally and in one sense, mastery doesn't come naturally of anything, right? You have to put effort into it. So the ability for you to switch between these different modes, you've had to learn in these different areas. And that means you've literally spent time 
dedicated to becoming better and improving in that area. And that shows a lot of drive and self-direction. And that's one of the best, you know, or recurring quality in all the leaders. I, I agree. I think those are things that I also I admire you. That's just my way of saying I admire you. I like how you can do that. You can, I can, I like how we're similar, I guess. I love, I can be up on stage talking to 10,000 people, or I can be writing, they're literally up on my screen right now. I deployed about 15 minutes before this call and finished up some tests with one of my engineers, Nick. <laughs> awesome. No, yeah. so I think that range is, is important, right? Because I think, and that's another way, I think it's just a fancy way all, all of what we were just talking about, I was saying outcome orientation, right? If you're the best resource at a particular time to do a certain thing on the critical path, then you figure out how to get it done. Yeah, I was talking with the CTO of William Sonoma. They also do Pottery Barn. They're actually headquartered in San Francisco. And he came on, we were talking, he had this amazing way he beautifully described outcome-based approaches. And it was, I was like, I'm, I'm team Yazir. Like, I love the way that you described that. And I'm all about the outcome too, but you get such different results when you are outcome driven versus activity driven. Yes. And yeah. it's easy to fall into that. And I do think that's one of the things that I also have to actively try to fight against, right? The larger the company, the easier the tendency, be because it's just so big and there's the span, especially globally where you know, it's, if you're a time zone away or 12, like we are for this conversation, yeah, you can imagine trying to fix that issue or finish a build with your engineer. Something happens, you're like, oh, but I, he just went to sleep. I guess I'll talk to him in eight hours. Like, well, you just lost a day. Uh, but uh, right, I think large organizations have a tendency, if not check, to go into this process orientation. I came off of another meeting yesterday, not yesterday, but very recently, where the team they had the totally wrong outcome, but they spent all their time trying to justify to me why they followed the steps they were supposed to. And it was much more important that they, they, they showed me like the stack of paper. They're like, well, I went to step A and then I was supposed to talk to person B. And I said, you know what, from a, and that's one of the big changes we're trying to drive. I said, this is the wrong result. It didn't matter. Hey, well, let's, let's start with that. And so rather than trying to justify why you shouldn't be blamed, let's just, I don't care about blame. Let's go fix the issue. And that was, it was just interesting, right? Because that required, it sounds so trivial and it sounds so obvious, but you know, to having to spend energy on that, I think is important to signal to the teams of that's how you put it into practice. Yeah, and then as you transition from engineer to leadership, you're constantly having to reallocate and your energy from being completely technical to just a little bit of people stuff to a little bit more people stuff, 50, 50 split. And then you continue on into the C level where you're not writing code as a daily practice, even though you maybe can. Right. And so I'm curious what your advice is for individuals that are new leaders or beginning that transition. Yeah. So I think a couple of things, the first is to really, and I think it also, uh, there's different, as you, as you outlined very clearly, I think that's a good way of thinking about it. I, I think there's a difference between being a new first line, uh, you know, engineering leader versus a second line versus as you become more senior uh, and then maybe become a CXO at some point. So I think on the earlier end is as a first line manager, it's not the, the, I think the major difference, because at that point you should still, in my view, be spending a significant amount of your time uh, actually with the team and contributing. Uh, but then uh, as a first line engineering manager, I think it's important that you figure out how to help your other engineers be productive. Right? And let me just do a quick sidebar on this because I, I, I hear the, and, and it's very important here that you have to figure out um, if that's what you like to do, right? Because certainly I've made my fair share of mistakes in saying, right, the classic, oh, you're a good technical lead, let's make you an engineering manager. Right? And it was just right, oil and water. Right, the person, it just didn't fit. Right? The skills of, and the time you need to spend in coaching your team and helping get them aligned right, and creating uh, a better environment for them to work so that they can be more productive. Right? Those, that just wasn't the sweet spot. And if it's not the sweet spot, it's a good time to figure that out. Right? And at that point, if your company doesn't have a good technical track for you to continue to advance, you should find a new company. Um, <laughs> yes. So I think that's important, but I, I think uh, expanding and, and then, sh as you said, shifting the mix of time uh, to helping your team. Because at, at any level, I think part of being a leader is 
creating the right, helping your team understand the context and then creating the environment, the resources in which they feel empowered to go, to go be successful. Right? And so in shifting from an individual contributor to a first line engineering or just a first line manager, I think spending more time on the people aspect uh, of helping them understand the strategy and helping them and helping coach them and develop them, I think is important. And then I think uh, as you continue down the spectrum, I, I think it's just a it's just a question of degree, right? The time, uh, the the more senior you get, then the more time that you have to spend about helping people understand the context, Because right? I think it's very hard, right? It's very easy to taskmaster yourself. Right? I can go yes. on Asana or I can go on whatever. Pick your pick your uh, workflow. Prashant, right? the CTO over there, he's awesome, Asana. So pick whatever tool you like, but it's very easy to task master yourself, right? If you're driven, you can give, right? And, and as you get more senior, you can't, ta you can maybe task master, right? Your seven or eight developers. And, but as you get to second line manager and beyond, that's not possible anymore. And so I think it took me a while to realize, right? The importance of then creating that context and helping the team understand that. Because once they have that, they can connect their own internal drive to that. And that's the part of building the team. You want to have people who, uh, buy into that and are excited uh, to to go do that. And so I, I think the advice is first spend time on the people because especially as you make the transition from individual contributor to manager because I think that's right, especially among some of my more techie developers they, they have a view or if they're coming from that background it's like only code is value right managers suck right and <laughs> the more senior you are the more right, the more right, you guys are PPT lovers and and uh, the less time you spend actually doing real work. And it's like no man actually you know, coaching other developers, creating context so you can actually orchestrate and direct people's energies towards a goal of like you couldn't code yourself, no matter how much of a rock star you are, uh, becomes increasingly important. And I struggled with that because the, the less, it's not, I think, hands-on. So for me, just maybe as how I thought about it, because I struggled with that as well. I'm like, wait a sec, I'm spending less time hands-on. And I felt really guilty about that. And even, it's something I struggle with now because my first instinct is let me go see the code or show me where it's broken or let's go write that page together right? and let's sketch it out and I, if i do that too much then people are like well who's running the team and who's thinking who's steering the ship for the long term and so it's something actually that's a continual uh, battle for for me as well and so one of the things that's helped me over time as i've uh, transitioned into different roles has been to redefine what hands-on means if, so hands-on as individual contributors, you know, you do your check-in, right? You take it through the build pipeline or whatever you're doing. As a manager, hands-on means developing your people, making sure everyone's connected, right? For me now, hands-on means shaping the culture and making sure people have as clear of a view and understanding of both the company strategy and how it connects to what we're trying to do. And so for me, I've had to redefine what hands-on means because otherwise then... I, I just, I just lose control. I'm getting goosebumps. So like I, I, I'm getting goosebumps, man. It's, it's beautiful. Like I love, I love how we can be two humans having completely separate experiences. But then when we come together in this conversation, there's just like, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm like, sing the song, man. You're doing, like, I love it. I love hearing it because you, you, like a child, you go through it and you learn to walk. And then you're just excited when you run into other people who have, traversed the uh the stack as well and uh yeah i'm so i'm curious now you said you mentioned in in the last discussion we just had about you aligning with lenovo's values and what you're trying to do can you give me a, a broad overview of where lenovo's focus is and what the big missions are for the next uh foreseeable future ah okay no absolutely so I think Lenovo is on a very interesting journey and we're at a very particular point in our history. Uh, so maybe we'll take it from a couple of directions. I think broadly Lenovo is known for what I'm talking to you on now, ThinkPads and laptops and computers. Uh, and between us and HP, we've been number one in the computer industry for the last, I don't know, eight or nine years, give or take. Uh, but everyone knows PCs as an industry or personal computers as an industry is declining, right? It's, uh, I think the last quarter was the first one in many, many quarters where we actually saw some growth, but broadly it's stable to declining. Uh, and so what we've done is we've, for the last few years, we've been working on, trans on two major transformations as a company. The first major transformation is to go from a very 
product centric company, right? So we just sell the black boxes or we sell a desktop or an all in one. And it's a one time sale. Thanks, Joel, for being a customer. I guess I'll see you in 2.4 years when you're going to go <laughs> and hopefully you'll buy us again. Right? That was the model. We sold hardware and we had a, a, a one time sale. And so we want to go from something that's very product centric into something that's much more uh, consumer and customer centric. And what that practically means is we have to, <laughs> again, at the risk of sounding trivial, you have to know who your customer is. Right? So yeah. rather than see you later, Mr. X, I don't even, I probably didn't even know you were Joel. I just you know, sold it to the channel and the channel sold it to you or you got it from Best Buy. And right? now it's much more about, well, if you, join, right, if you register for Lenovo ID, here's some interesting things we can offer you. We can keep your computer up to date. Right? We can make it less likely to fail. We can be proactive. And so I think just from a company that uh, was very you know, push driven, right? here's our product, push it into the market, into understanding what customers like, right? So if you agree, Joel, we would collect anonymized data about how you use it so we can better optimize the screen, the battery, the touchpad, even the keyboard. So there's things like that, which are, there's a whole set of both tech, hard technical changes as well as soft cultural changes about that major transition. And the second access goes back to the issue of Lenovo being, right, especially three years ago, our our revenue and our business groups were heavily skewed towards uh, PC, which was a stable to slightly declining industry. And so the second major transformation as a company is then moving from a single business to a multi-business. So uh, in 2014, so four years ago now, uh, we did two acquisitions, one of the Motorola Mobility from Google. And so we strengthened oh, wow. our global uh, mobility uh, platform and we sell phones and mobile solutions and the second one is we acquired the uh, IBM x86 server business so uh, in, in, in those two steps we went from one major business to three major business right PCs to and then mobile and data center group and so moving and that's also I think a very tricky transition for a company to navigate because it's going from undivided 100% focus on something to now you have split focus as a company. And so we've had to engineer uh, a lot of transformation around those dimensions. So that's broadly uh, where we're coming from as a company and what we were focused on doing. So I'm just curious, uh, being you know business nerd, did, uh, did, they, did those divisions remain operating independently or did they come in under Lenovo? Like how did that work? Ah, so I think they are, it's a mix is I guess the best way to put it. If we think about the archetypes of how companies can come together, there's the holding company model, which says mm -hmm. it's mainly a financial, like a conglomerate, right? which is I invest in you and I take a seat on your board and we appoint some board members and, and the chairman uh, and that's it. We have a financial stake, right? The next level would be uh, kind of, um, right? The business runs itself, but the shared services around HR, uh, around technology, around finance, we try to keep together. Uh, and then the other one is just full integration, which is right, everything together. And so we've chosen something in uh, the, the middle, because I think we recognize that it's very different to run a phone business and a server business, which is now a data center business, not just servers. Um, most interestingly, again, most people don't know that, which is something we're working on. But we recognize that it's very different in running these businesses. So we didn't want to fully integrate and say, right, just run everything like we used to run the PC business. At the same time, there are, right, we do believe that there are certain things that we get uh, scale out of. Uh, and so we do have uh, shared platforms that we use because it makes sense. And just as an example, uh, I, my, my teams, we build for Lenovo, all of the e-commerce and an online uh, based platform because it should be shared, right? Why do I need two shopping carts? I don't need two configurators. I don't <laughs> need two baskets. I don't need two catalogs. I, a lot of those things that make sense to share, we share. And that's the beauty of technology because I think you can get some of the advantages of scale and sharing globally. Uh, and at the same time, you build the architecture in such a way that where the business teams need the differentiated uh, services that they can still create that on top of the platform that you have. And so I think that's an interesting example of how uh, kind of technology layered thinking abstraction uh, as well as, you know, notions of reuse actually play out writ large at the enterprise level, because that's kind of the pattern other shared services follow as well. And as companies have become digital, I think you see a lot of the thinking kind of, uh, uh, kind of crossing over. Right. So microservices 
I loved it. I, I was just uh, having another discussion with some colleagues and I saw a chart and it was talking about uh, how we've been re-engineering uh, some of our technology and our platforms to be much more microservice oriented right? because we're in, on a big kick to uh, pursue greater agility, right? greater and fewer dependencies for the teams to move independently. And I thought, hey, that's a cool chart. I wonder which of my team is presenting it. And it totally wasn't my team, right? Then it was, it was actually a chart from my team. But then I had the business teams trying to explain to other business teams what microservices was and why it was the greatest thing and why they were extremely excited about what it was going to bring for their business. Um, so anyway, that was, uh, it's a bit of a long answer, but it goes back to the question, uh, right? We're just, you know, in terms of what we're up to and what we're changing, I, I do see a lot of technology concepts um, kind, of, kind of finding their way into the mainstream in ways that uh, both the business is conscious of and maybe not so conscious of. Oh man, that was an amazing answer. Yes. Okay, so you mentioned something. You said that you guys are in the server business? Yes, yeah, so we have three businesses now, which one is the uh, personal computer, so PC and smart devices. That's more of our yeah. traditional, especially on the PC. The second one is mobility. So we sell uh, Motorola brand and uh, Lenovo brand. Uh, so Motorola brand phones globally, and then Lenovo brand phones in China. And then we have a data center group, which offers data center solutions, including uh, hardware, servers, storage, networking. So when you said that's the one that most people don't know about, right? Uh, correct. Correct. Okay. But now, is it, is it, so is it the hardware or is it somewhat like, can I go up and boot an instance like remotely, like a Amazon type deal or no? Uh, so it's a good question. We're not a public cloud service provider, but we okay. have our own private cloud, for example. And we also offer hybrid cloud technologies, right? IOT platform technology. So it's definitely not just server hardware. We've been making a, a significant expansion into offering full stack solutions. For example, we were partnering with Amazon on, on their Greengrass IOT platform. Right? We were working with Microsoft on Azure Stack for hybrid cloud. And so we have hyper-converged offerings. We work with Nutanix, for example. And mm -hmm. so we actually have uh, and have made a pretty explicit strategic focus to move away from selling you know, one-way, two-way boxes, which again, looks, starts to look a little bit like the, uh, the PC industry, which is kind of flat and, and not super exciting on growth. Right? The growth is all about uh, the software, right? The future, because as a CIO, I'm also a customer of our own data center group. Right. So the future is everything software. No, not everything, everything, right? But if you look at the profit pools and the value migration over time in, in what has historically been right, kind of the infrastructure services and the technology computing services, it's, it's software defined. And so I think um, that's, that's been a very interesting transition. Yeah, people will lean towards convenience is like by their default, right? And so if you've got convenience without an increase in cost, right? And you have convenience without inconvenience, then that will win. And so that's largely the part why the exodus from the physical machines to the Amazons really happened because now I don't have to call up a data center and build me a machine. I can just deploy one. Now, that doesn't mean there's no use cases for having your own stuff. For example, there are some companies that I know that are working on some very cool stuff and it will never, it'll always be on-prem, right? Just because of the, the nature of their business. But I, I love the fact that you're so aware of uh, where the industry is going and that you're leading the company in that regard, right? Because that, that gives me, like, I would invest in Lenovo now, knowing that you're there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, look, cool. things are going to happen. The right things are going to happen. Like if somebody said Lenovo, I'd be like, look, you know, I don't know how their financials are, but they have some bright people. Like, and, and I always tend to, to invest my time and energy and efforts into technologies where I know the people are bright. So I'll actually look up who, who's at what companies and who's behind the technology uh, before I integrate it into my company at times. I've done that. Cool. That's yeah. a good side effect of our discussion then. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious to know, there was one thing in, in the show notes that I had never seen before. And so I must ask about it. Uh, two speed IT. Is okay. that a, can you explain that phrase to me? 
Yes, absolutely. So uh, two-speed or bimodal IT uh, within the CIO community, I think Gartner had actually coined it. Um, I, I think it just refers to the fact um, that I think Gardner was trying to shake people out of their torpor and say, you can't just be the guys who are looking after the server room and reorganizing database tables. <laughs> That's not the future of IT. And so they said, look, for some foreseeable future, there's still going to be on-prem and then you're going to have, you know, existing things that are non-virtualized, non-elastic, non-horizontally scalable, and that's fine. Uh, we'll call that speed one. Uh, speed two is then the things that are what you need to do when faced with high uncertainty, right? So exploration, experiments, right? Responsiveness uh, in a way that no one was used to. And so the, the, the bimodal or the, the two speed just referred to that. You had kind of one speed for the existing uh, and the other speed for going more, uh, more quickly. And so that's what it is. And I think it's something I think came from, from Gartner that they coined. That being said, I think uh, the concept makes a lot of sense. And I think, I think, how do I say it without maybe saying something I shouldn't? I think we can always cut stuff. It's not live. <laughs> <laughs> so spiritually, I think it's very accurate, right? The notion of you can't just do the same old, same old. I, I don't think anybody would argue with that. Right. I, I, I quite frankly, I find it uh, polarizing and I really think it does in some contexts uh, more harm than good to do that label. Right? And I'll take an experience. And so having, so I think the spirit of don't do the same old, and that's absolutely a recipe for stagnation. Uh, absolutely makes sense. But I think how you frame it on the culture, as we've talked about, is so important. And so just to share from my experience, the reason I, I really stay away from this two speed right, is, is that it, 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 uh, we tried it at Lenovo and it separated people into classes. Right? Mm. We, we, right, we said, because I think we actually gave it a try right, a, few, a few years ago. Um, we were like, oh, right, we need to be two speed. Yeah, we don't want to just be one speed. And then the way it took hold in the organization is people took sides, right? People were, <laughs> oh, I'm, no. I'm, the, I, I'm the fast speed, you're the slow speed. Oh, you're bad, and you're that. all gonna be yeah. fired or you won't have jobs. And, and it just created this terrible organization dynamic where it was the have and the have nots. And oh. it created all sorts of tension. It was very unproductive, right? In the worst way you could imagine, right? It created real, cultural tension in a way that was right, negative uh, energy for the company and, and for the team. And so right, rather than two speed, right, when I became CIO, we did away with that. And I said, guys, everyone has skin in the game. Right? The old stuff doesn't work, but we're not two speed. Right? My appeal to the team at that point to get away from this toxic, you're slow, I'm fast, it's your fault that I can't go live more quickly. Right? That's not a winning recipe. And so my appeal to the team, and part of the reason I think it's so exciting to be a C whatever XO, whether it's uh, an information or it's technology or digital, I think we can talk about that there. I think they're all the same thing, by the way. Yeah, but, they're chiefs um, of the tribe. It's just, right? yeah, um, But what we got away is, guys, technology is everywhere. And I think that's why it's so exciting to be in this position. And it's a privilege now, right? As all these things come together, uh, the point is everyone should have all these speeds. Everyone had all these speeds. And I made it a very public point. Like, for example, in the old way of looking at it, if you were in the one speed, let's say you were the command center, right? Or the, the call center that resolves tickets. Every company has it. Someone needs to help resolve tickets when your users have issues, right? Um, not sexy, right? Wrong, right? So I, my team, and I shocked my team because I think the command center leader was used to being, yeah, I'm just the ticket person and I guess I just take calls all day. I'm like, no, that's totally, totally wrong, right? And they perked up and they said, what do you mean that's totally wrong? I said, well, have you heard of AI? And they're like, yes. It's like, do you have data? They're like, yes, right? Because they get, you know, tens of thousands of calls a, a month with many, all sorts of issues. And I'm like, so you should be thinking, right? your strategy should involve thinking about how you can apply AI and machine learning. Right? You should go be building a bot, right? you should be running analytics on the stream, you should be having dynamic allocation, you should be profiling your agents, you should be profiling your users. And, the lead, and I think that was a touchstone moment because my, my appeal was, guys, there's nowhere where technology is at. And I flipped the question around on them because if, 
anyone thought that they didn't have to be multi-speed, right, then you're thinking about the problem the wrong way. Right? If anyone to the answer of can you apply, and it doesn't have to be AI, it can be whatever technology is relevant for you, right? whether it's Kafka and streaming and processing on how you want to look at event data, whatever the answer is, whatever your domain, wherever you are, whatever level you are in the organization, if the answer to can I apply new technology to explore something interesting new that would change the way I work? And if the answer was no, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Right? Absolutely thinking about it the wrong way. And that was a real eye opening for the team. Right? And, uh, same thing for the guys in the, in, the, in the data center, right? You've got guys who are like, I've been a database admin, I reorganize Oracle and DB tables for a living, and I tune parameters to make it perform better. It's like, that's well and good, but right, so what are you going to do when? IAS and PAS take over the world increasingly. Right? And so for them, it was, okay guys, software defined data center is coming, whether that's software defined, whether that's software defined networks, right? whether that's the software uh, defined uh, convergence of uh, hyper convergence between right, the, uh, the compute uh, and the network and the storage, all these things are coming together, whether it's from self provisioning. And so once the teams, got around to that, I, I think it took them a little bit of time to, and I think they were scared, right? Because it's, it's actually a very different skill set of, you know, kind of running things in a more traditional way, and which we still need, uh, to becoming much more of a code-driven, right, even in operations, uh, uh, skill set. And so the multi-speed for my teams was really, we need to do all of the above. Right? There's no one who's slow or fast. Right? It's a little bit like wartime and peacetime generals I talked about earlier. Right? You're not wartime. You're not in war all the time, hopefully. Right. Right? Yeah. Well, Although, there is, that's a red flag. <laughs> like it sometimes. Uh, nor, are you at, nor are you perpetually at peace. And for my teams, there's, there's areas where you guys need to go attack and explore and learn new. But yes, we've still got our SAP instance and we still have to feed it and care it. And those are all valuable things, right? Those are all valuable things. It wasn't inherently right, ensuring that our SAP instance is performing at its peak is inherently less valuable than getting the e-commerce site built, right, with the new releases once a week, right? There's nothing inherently different <clears throat> about those. They're just different types of value. So that was a, a fascinating set of discussions with the team, and it's taken me a while to get that to take hold. But I think as it takes hold, right, it, it's really good to see the positive energy of the team as they imagine what are the new possibilities uh, that they can pursue as well in each of their domains. Uh, I that, love was, your that was really long, but anyway. No, it, it was poetic. It was beautiful. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy listening to you speak. When you're talking, things are going through my mind, right? So I, when you were mentioning that about the, the data center, the tickets, I thought, you know, they are playing such an incredibly important role because at the end of the day, the reason why uh, a business is a collection of repeatable processes that brings value to the market. So there's a customer and that customer is exchanging, you know, earning money or time and, and then they're spending it with your products. And then that you then take that revenue and create more value for them. And then you continue that cycle and that's how, you know, you get income and continue the business, right? So your ability, every job at the organization can be drawn, there can be a line drawn back directly to the value you bring the customer. And if anything, the people answering the tickets are like incredibly close to the customer. They play an absolutely essential role uh, with sol re resolving problems in communication, which as a company, nothing's worse than a company going dark, right? When you try to reach out for something. So yeah, they're massively incredible, uh, massively important as well as the individuals that are redesigning the, the tables or making improvements in the data center because every single day you have competitors that are making their system smarter, better, faster, stronger, right? And now you have the responsibility to your customers to provide them the same level of service and response and speed that the other individuals are so they can be proud that they're your customers and that brings them value and that continues on um, allowing you ultimately at the end of the day to, to earn some money so that you can en enjoy your life and, and have your family and, and do the things that we're really here to do in life and then get to solve some great problems and then have that, that nice uh, integration between all of these different forces that are always at play. And so 
yeah, I'm, I'm constantly finding myself in a, as a leader, reconnecting that value for others. And, and while we get in the weeds and we're on the details to bring them up out of it and say, look, this is the why, this is why we're doing it. I, I'm a big fan of the Simon Sinek, who I'm sure um, you're familiar with. And so I'm, I'm always connecting back the why. And uh, I love how you did that because you did it in such a creative way with the AI. I'm going to totally, I'm going to make that a clip because I didn't think of that. And that's a really unique way of, of saying, look, you can be incredibly creative and extraordinarily valuable by the way you're tagging and air traffic controllering the, uh, if that's a word, uh, managing the data flow. No, so I'm, yeah, I, I loved it. And I think that it just goes back to what we, one of the themes we hit on earlier, which is around the spread and the democratization of this, right? As people have more fluency in it, it's more and more possible for people to, right? You're just limited by your imagination. That's what I told my team, right? You guys are just too used to thinking about it in a, in a certain way, right? There are no limits. It's just, it's here, right? If you can't imagine something drastically different and wildly, hopefully wildly better, right? Then you should start looking within yourself. Did you read my book? I have not, but it's now on my oh. card. Well, you'll, you'll see that as I say, like you're only limited by your own imagination. It was this big uh, epiphany, I guess I had with like myself just thinking one day, I'm like, I saw the different people and how they worked. And after I guess I had enough interactions, I said, these people, everyone's creative and people limit themselves. And if creativity can be tied, can, you can learn these things and be open to them. And, and really in life, you're, you're limited by your own creativity, your own imagination. And interestingly yeah. at companies, I think, even for myself, one of the other limiters is, is also about, uh, is about ego, right? And I think one of the things that limit, because I, I think what's changed as pace picks up and, right, there, especially when dealing with areas of uncertainty, right, it doesn't, I, this notion of that that was wrong, right, sometimes can be very hard to, to say, right? And sometimes you've limited yourself because it's, right, you, you feel foolish saying, well, that was wrong or, Right, as a leader, because I think the right, and in some cases our, our cultural stereotypes of what we hold up to be good leaders are the firm, the strong, the resolute. Uh, and I think that works when things are pretty clear and you know what you want to do. Right? But if the facts on the ground and your situation is very dynamic, then what was true yesterday may not be true anymore. Right? And the fact that as a leader, if you're adapting to that uh, and changing your mind, it doesn't make you a bad leader. In fact, I think that can make you a good leader, but it just feels strange. It's like, hey, you know what I said last week? I thought about it and the assumptions don't hold. So that's, that's wrong. Uh, and so I, I think I found I've had to work on letting go of one ego, right? It's like, I'm wrong. Let's do something different. Hopefully we found out fast. Uh, and then uh, secondly, I think in, also in China, right? Because there's this notion of, um, having face, right? And so as okay. a leader, right, face just meaning right, having respect, right, having, I guess mm -hmm. I'm not doing a good job in English of, um, of, of converting and translating the concept, but this notion of, of, of face, which is broadly written about, right, I, I think I've had to find myself putting that down, right? Putting down ego, putting aside this notion of, I, I need to be seen as being right. And, you know, if this is the right answer now, given the new assumptions to, to just go with it. I loved it. I, yeah, I'm wrong a lot and I attempt at my best to reduce the space between uh, me realizing I'm wrong and then communicating my new findings because that's, that's always important. And then I also found in, in my own, you speak a lot about self-awareness without using the word self-awareness. And that's what I really, one of the things I very much enjoy about you. Uh, but when, when we were talking about uh, ego, that is, to me, it reminds me a lot of discipline. Like it's always there, it's always something you're wor you work on. And then the more that you allow yourself to be aware of it, the better you can respond and, and train yourself to, to handle it. And I don't mind being wrong. Um, I mean, there's always that gut of like, oh, that sucks, I'm wrong. But like, I don't, I don't, I don't let it get to me, like get me down and persistently uh, pull me down. But I, I also rationalize, sorry, the point I was trying to make was the way I rationalize my acceptance of that is by saying that 
um, I don't repeat the same mistakes multiple times. So I can be wrong and I can make a mistake, but I rarely am repeating the mis that same exact mistake multiple times. And if it happens a second time, it's enormously loud to the point where I will take some large action to correct it because I shouldn't be making the same mistakes twice. So I, I, I acknowledge it the first time, I figure it out, and then if I notice that same one happening again, I'm like, this is an extraordinarily rare occurrence, now we have to really uh, reflect on this, so. I agree. Yeah. Man, we did it, we made a podcast. Awesome. It was fantastic. Here we go.